Hello, this is Dr. Rhonda Falheim. We're going to be discussing the electrical system of the heart. Really amazing stuff. So, pretty exciting. Hold on. Here we go. Uh, when we talk about the electrical system of the heart, we're, we're actually referring to clusters of very specialized cells, cells that have some unique characteristics and um, as a result of that uh, these cells are what we refer to as the electrical system. And so the first characteristic that we talk about is called myogenicity. And myogenicity means that this specialized cell is capable of generating an impulse all by itself. It, you know, we're used to thinking about the role of the nervous system and and how a skeletal muscle contracts and we know that you know we have to have a um, a, a motor neuron that actually chemically interacts with the skeletal muscle cell in order to cause that to contract well when we're talking about the electrical system of the heart that's not the case um, within the heart we have these specialized cells that i'm describing to you now and they are actually capable of generating an electrical impulse themselves, just spontaneously. Another characteristic that they have is what we refer to as autorhythmicity. So they would, uh, you know, they would be autorhythmic cells. Um, and and autorhythmicity means that this impulse that they're capable of creating is going to occur um, as a rhythm. Okay, and uh, these clusters of cells then can generate a rhythm. And oh my goodness, doesn't when our heart beats, isn't that to a rhythm? Absolutely. Well, that's not a coincidence. That's a result of the activity of these cells that we're talking about here, these unique cells. Uh, now, in addition to myogenicity and autorhythmicity, these cells are not they do not contract along with the other myocardial cells. Okay, so you have the myocardial cells that are contracting, doing the work, moving the blood through, and these cells do not participate in that aspect. These are the cells that will cause those muscle cells to depolarize. Looking at um, the arrangement of these specialized cells, well, when we have a cluster of these cells, we have a cluster of these specialized cells within the, um, starting off, we have them within the right atrium of the heart, the, the superior aspect of the right atrium. We have a cluster of these specialized cells and we refer to that as a node, a node, all right? So um, you can also see that we have a pathway of these specialized cells that travels down through and goes deep into the myocardial tissue. So let's name this, uh, these areas of this specialized, um, these specialized cells of the heart. And again, these specialized cells are the cells that are spontaneously deep, um, depolarizing, generating an action potential that will depolarize the myocardium of the heart. So we start off in the again in the right atrium with what we call the sinoatrial node we also refer to that as the SA node and this is the pace what we refer to also as the pacemaker of the heart the the, the the mother of pacemakers of the heart this is it this is what sets the sets the pace of the heart so this when um, when this when this node generates an impulse you can see that it is sending that impulse to both atria. So what's occurring here is that the myocardium of both atria is being de depolarized at the same time. And that's from the SA node. Well, this should make sense in light of the fact that we know that both atria contract at the same time and both ventricles contract at the same time. And the myocardium will contract following depolarization. So we know that this electrical activity has to happen first before these myocardial cells will contract. So this is step one. We get the impulse generated from the SA node 
and both atria are depolarized simultaneously. Now, as a result of the impulse coming from the SA node, the AV node will be stimulated and generate an impulse as well. This is the atrioventricular node. It's also in the right atrium of the heart. And when it generates its impulse, you can see that this is, this is how that impulse is going to cross the fibrous skeleton of the heart. Remember the fibrous skeleton that we said was across here? Acted as an electrical in, um, insulator. Well, when the AV node fires, that impulse will cross that fibrous skeleton and come down through both of what we call the bundle branches of, of the electrical system. And these bundle branches, again, this, this is a pathway of those specialized cells that we talked about. We have the left and the right bundle branch, and you can see each bundle branch follows the shape of the ventricle, follows the shape of the ventricle. And then, um, so the impulse travels from the AV node down through the bundle branches, and then we have what are called Purkinje fibers, and these are even smaller pathways of these specialized cells that go deep into the myocardial tissue, and they will carry the impulse uh, into the, the, the tissue and uh, depolarize those cells. Um, so let's take it from the top. We've got uh, depolarization, we've got, I'm sorry, an impulse generated from the SA node. It's going to depolarize both atria, which will also uh, create an impulse coming from the AV node, which will travel down both bundle branches around the ventricles and deep into the myocardial tissue of the ventricles. So what's happening throughout this process is we are depolarizing the myocardial tissue, which will then be followed by what? Muscle contraction. Right, muscle contraction. Oh, sorry. So let's take a look at this. Okay, so let's just be reminded then about what is influencing the rate at which this um, depolarization of myocardial tissue will occur, because we we know that if you if the if the sinoatrial node, the SA node, if that's just left alone, it's going to generate an impulse up to about a hundred beats per minute. Well. So that would mean that the heart, would, the heart rate would be about 100 beats per minute. And um, we know that that's not true at rest. We know that the heart beats 70, 75 beats per minute on the average at rest. So, so what is it that's causing um, a, a, the, the difference there, the difference between the 100 beats per minute and the 70 to 75 beats per minute? Well, if we take a look at who's in charge when we're at rest. Who's in charge when we are at rest? And isn't that 70 to 75 beats per minute the resting heart rate? Yes, it is. So we know that it's the parasympathetic system that's in charge. Um, so parasympathetic, we know that that would have a slowing in influence 
on the SA node, and indeed it does slow that rate to 70 to 75 beats per minute. Uh, so again, if we, we, left that we left that SA node without parasympathetic influence, it would beat much faster. But it doesn't need to. It, when we're at rest, we don't need for the heart rate to be increased. And so the, the parasympathetic system brings that down for us. When we look at the um, action potential and the myocardial contraction relaxation um, graphs here, um, one of the things that stands out is just how incredibly long the absolute refractory period is for these cells. And um, when we think about the heart, there's a very clear reason why that, why that is true. Um, so I want you to just think for a second, you know, why would we have such a long absolute refractory period? And you may want to remind yourself, what does refractory period mean? Well, uh, absolute refractory period means that it's the period of time during which a cell cannot entertain another impulse or another stimulation, another depolarization right then. So why would it be really, really long especially compared to skeletal muscle cells. It's, it's a very long time. Okay, um, well, I'm going to have to tell you because this is not live. <laughs> the, um, the reason is because the chambers of the heart have to have time to fill. If you think about it, if we just allowed those myocardial cells to um, be stimulated, 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 and just contract very rapidly, those chambers wouldn't be full of blood. And... Um, so the contraction would not be ejecting blood out into the system, and our system would suffer deficits of, from the, of oxygen, and we wouldn't be getting rid of our waste. And um, it would be ugly. It would be ugly, and we'd probably die. OK. So um, again, um, very important, very important uh, component there. And here we have, again, we know that these are the, the uh, steps of an action potential. When we look at a graph like this, what we're looking at is um, just a chart of the electrical activity of the heart. And we call this either an EKG or an EE, I mean, I'm sorry, EKG or an ECG, electrocardiogram. And... Um, what this represents, again, is the electrical activity of the heart. And I just need to make this point that we're not talking here about the efficiency of the heart or the muscle activity. We're talking about that uh, the, the, the movement of the electrical impulse through the heart. And, um, and that's what's measured here. The way we get this reading is by there being electrodes placed around the heart on the exterior. Uh, just, you know, sticky electrodes placed around the heart area. And so what you're seeing in this graph is actually the direction that the impulse is moving towards electrodes away from electrodes. And when you print that out, this is what it looks like. So each of these, um, what we call waves, um, each of these represents some kind of electrical activity within the heart. And if, we, if you think about what we just, the, the pathway that we just described, SA node, AV node, bundle branches, and Purkinje fibers, um, that can carry you right through an EKG because this is going to represent what happens in, within, um, within the heart as that, after that, following that SA node. So, um, so what happens when the SA node generates an impulse? It depolarizes both atria. And that's what this P wave represents, the depolarization of both atria. Again, we're only looking at electrical activity. All right, so what happens after we depolarize both atria? Well, we're going to then depolarize both ventricles. And that's our QRS. And again, the reason this is so large and it comes back down underneath the main line, all of this, is because we're talking about the directional changes that that impulse makes 
as it comes around both ventricles. So QRS is depolarization of both ventricles. And then when we look at our T wave, we're talking about repolarization of the ventricles. So we have depolarization of both atria, depolarization of both ventricles, repolarization of the ventricles. Each of these waves will be followed by the actual contraction of the myocardium. So if once we, after following the P wave, we would expect both atria to contract. Following the QRS, we would expect both ventricles to contract. Okay. Um, now you're probably wondering and you're wanting to ask me, where do the atria repolarize? We show where the ventricles repolarize, but where do the atria repolarize? Well, their repolarization does occur, but it occurs in here somewhere, so it gets lost and we can't really see it. This is a great picture that um, just showing what happens where the um, depolarization and repolarization and it co how it coincides with the EKG. So you can, you can spend some time and go through this. Um, they did a great job on this picture. I really like this. But again, um, electrical activity of the heart will depolarize the myocardium and then it will be followed by muscle contraction.